Okay, so this is the last lecture in the solid shape series. Uh, yeah, Zong, you asked about um, the dimensional analysis of this uh, equation relating the spin of the one vector, which is in the tangent plane, into the two vector, which is also in the tangent plane on, to a surface. Uh, and and relating that to the Gaussian curvature. So first of all, let's look at the right side of the equation. K is the product of two curvatures. Each curvature is, is measured in radians per millimeter. Okay, so this is units of radians per millimeter squared. <laughs> sigma, sigma 1 and 2 are both un, unit things, so they don't they don't they don't have any uh, contribution to the dimensions. Mm -hmm. So this thing uh, on the right side is in radians per millimeter all squared. The left side, omega one two is a angle, a radians per millimeter. Uh, <coughs> uh, measure. Uh, and taking a derivative of something puts another a spatial derivative takes another one over millimeters. So you have radians per millimeter squared. Well, since radians are unitless, we just have one units of one over millimeter squared in both cases. Okay. Um, the way we were using it, however, this equation was essentially to integrate both sides and then to using essentially a, a form of, I guess it's Green's theorem, to turn the, the aerial derivative into a, uh, an, a derivative around the boundary. And, that, and so what you end up with is this equation. <laughs> so again, let me remind you of the notation. This is the derivative a walking direction S <laughs> of the spin corresponding to walking dire direction S integrated over the boundary of an area. So on the screen, you see a, a polar circle that we're walking around in, in the example on the, in the left side, right? <laughs> Uh, the thing that the arrows are attached to is that uh, circuit, okay? And so that area inside that circle, in fact, it works either if you choose the area above the circle or the complement, <laughs> uh, but let's just use the one above the circle. Okay, so now the integral around the boundary, which is to say around that curve, that curve we're walking around, of this has units, well, first of all, an integral around a circuit is measured in millimeters, right? <clears throat> so, okay, so this has got millimeters, and then the derivative is one over millimeters of something that's radians. <laughs> okay, so in other words, it's again radians per millimeter, sorry. It's radians times millimeters times one over millimeters. That is to say, its units of is radians. Uh, and this guy, this integral, has units of area. So, so that's millimeters squared. But this thing is in radians per millimeter all squared. So again, the mil it. It cancels, mm. and you and so you have a un, a unitless thing and a unit e equals a unitless thing. So there's the the dimensional analysis that you were after. Is that clear? Yeah. It's not clear. Okay. And so, where what what we had used that for was to to say that there is a a way to calculate uh, a way to calculate If you have a small enough circuit such that K is 
approximately constant within the region surrounded by the circuit. You take a little tiny circuit, right? <laughs> then this becomes the K, if K is constant comes out, this becomes just K times the area of that, of what's inside the circuit. which is something you can, if it's a small enough circle, you can measure, if you will, by uh, essentially projecting onto the tangent plane and saying that since it's very, very small, the area will be the same on the tangent plane. <coughs> so you know the area, you don't know this, but you can, then you can, if you will, stand on that thing, on that, uh, at a point on that circuit, and let your body be the uh, be the vector, <laughs> and walk around walk around the uh, the walk around the circuit uh, each time as the as the tangent plane swings, you just swing with it, <laughs> and when you come back, you won't be upright anymore, right? <laughs> And the angle between what you started at and where you ended it is is this uh, <coughs> uh, this uh, well the complement of this is the is the angle lost. It is the angle lost. And the angle lost is proportional to k times a. And you know a, and so you can compute k purely from the angle lost. In other words, if things are really flat, okay, then you'll have no length, no angle lost, and that'll give k equals zero. Right? <clears throat> and that's right, flat has Gaussian curvature zero. And as the as the property gets uh, as the object in that region becomes curvier and curvier, you lose more and more angle. Okay. <laughs> so um, this is a property that you use in algorithmically computing Gaussian curvature. Okay, enough of that. Okay, so we were talking last time about patterns of, of principal curvature. And to understand the patterns, we need a couple of notions from singularity theory. And at the same time, you should have a, at least a minimal understanding of what singularity theory tells us. Singu singularity theory talks about functions f from uh, Rn to Rp. So, for example, if you have a a mapping from a a surf a surface to its shade on your retina. Your retina is two dimensional. This is a a surface a, a value that is it's a mapping from position here to intensity on your retina. It's a map, mapping from R two to R two. Right? <clears throat> from a two-dimensional surface, well, strictly locally, a tangent plane there to a tangent plane at your retina. Okay. <clears throat> uh, there are pl plenty of mappings from R1 to R1, uh, and uh, and R2 to R1, and so on. And not anyway. The point is, you have in geometry, you have lots of functions that we that we care about. So, for example, the mapping of a point on the surface 
to its normal. Well, the normal is a point on a sphere. So it's an R2 to R2, right? <laughs> and so on, and that's true for all these directions. So the principal directions to, to a sphere, asymptotic directions to a sphere, they're all mappings from R2 to R2, right? <laughs> uh, now, the surprising result is that, okay, so you have N and P. And then we talk about uh, C parameter map mappings, C parameter families. Where there's one variable that can change. <clears throat> so for example, if we're walking along a path uh, on the surface, that one parameter that describes our what happens as we walk along gives you a series of a series of, of measurement of, of functions, which is called a one parameter as if C equals one is a one parameter family or is it a two parameter family? Well, singularity theory, first of all, defines the rank. of f at a point, okay? And basically what it says is a, in linear, uh, when, you, when you have a linear approximation of f, that is to say, uh, at, at the point you're talking about, is the mapping in a, in a neighborhood around Rn, does it <coughs> fully, have the dimension of RP or subdimension of RP or what have you. Rank has to do with the dimension of the of, of the transform. Okay. So for example, something that maps a plane to a plane has rank two, but something that maps a plane to a line has rank one. Something that has a maps a rank to a point, I mean, a, a, a plane to a point. As I said, something maps a plane to a line has rank one. Something that maps a plane to a point has rank zero, and so on. So, so rank is uh, calculated based on the p value. Yes, it's, the, it's the, well, it's not the p value. It's it's the dimension. It, the point is p can be two, mm -hmm. but this particular f doesn't map to all of our p. It's a two-dimensional map, but in the region of some point, it only maps okay. locally to a line. Looks like a, a surface embedding the 3D space. So you have a plane. Yeah, you have a plane. You have a uh, a a mapping, mm -hmm. and the mapping goes to another plane, this one, but it only around around in the two-dimensional region on the first plane. It only maps to a line. <laughs> locally in the second plane. That would be rank one. Okay. Okay, and so um, singularity theory talks about the uh, singularities, that's why it's called singularity, which are mappings of less than full rank. They don't map all the way to P. Subdimension sub of P. And with that, those definitions, the interesting thing is that there's a catalog that if you give me N, P, and C, those are integers, you, it turns out you can prove that there's a, that there's a full catalog known for every n, p, and c of the, of the generic situations and of the, uh, <clears throat> the generic uh, changes between uh, generic situations. So let me explain that. So let's just, for example, take 1, 1, <clears throat> and 0. No, one, 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 and one, excuse me. 
Okay, so for example, consider the uh, the function y equals x squared, x, sorry, x cubed minus cx. Okay, that's a mapping from one dimension x to one dimension y with a single parameter c. Right? And you can show that if c is negative, that this thing looks like like so, right? That is to say it has a single zero crossing. <laughs> and if C has the opposite sign, the positive sign, it looks like so. And those are the only generic situations, either three or one zero crossing, one at zero and two symmetric ones in this case, and at c equals zero, you get a, a non-generic situation that's just the function y equals x cubed. That's not generic in the sense that it, when it has a single, it has a single uh, zero crossing of multiplicity three at zero, and Essentially, every per smooth perturbation of it will either have three or one zero crossings. Or 100% of the, it, in the sense of a dense set of, there's only a very small subdimensional set of, of all possible functions that don't, either they'll go like so, or they'll, they'll have a single zero crossing. But they, but they won't stay having a multiplicity three. Zero crossing. So that's not generic. Okay. But the transition from this situation to the other situation I talked about goes through this generically. It goes through this non generic place, but the only way you can get from one family to another in transition is through that. Okay, so <laughs> this thing flattening out the, the two outside zero crossings coming together and eventually uh, coalescing at this and then getting a slope at, at, at the origin with only one zero crossing. So there's a generic, so this is the general situation. You can show that for one, 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 that's all that can happen. I don't care what function you have, the x cubed minus cx, any function at all. From one variable to another variable with a fixed, with single parameter c, is going to have exactly that behavior. That's really impressive, surprising. It, it all comes from, from careful polynomial analysis and, and analysis of what happens under deformations. Uh, and this, for a person studying deformations, as we do in image analysis, this is a particularly important kind of thing to understand. So I'm recommending that you look at singularity theory as a, at least to get a little bit of a, a little bit of a background in what, in what that is. But let me talk about the ones that we're more interested in. Enough time for all of them. And that one is the one we're, we're particularly interested in. Okay, map in from in geometry, mapping from two space to two space with one parameter. And again, there's a finite list of singular singularities. <clears throat> okay, the, the, these low rank. Okay, so so if you have insufficient rank, a, def, a deficit in rank that we talked about, you have a singularity. And the kinds of singularities that can occur here are folds and cusps. And that's all. Okay, so a fold is where the mapping becomes the mapping of one plane onto the other 
turns back on itself. Right? It becomes non one one. Right? <laughs> it's the same behavior as you see here for a function of one variable where you have this. At this point, the the function turns back on itself. It has there's two places that have the same value. Okay. That's a fold. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so it's multi in this function multiple to one mapping so that you cannot do inverse. Right. Precisely right. So you cannot do inverse. Okay. And so a folding is a singularity and a cusp is a singularity. And so in particular, if you look at the at the behavior of the map from the tangent plane to a surface to the unit sphere, what you find <coughs> is that it can have folds, and the fold can have cusps. Okay, talking about the, what, what is a cusp? A cusp is a 180 degree angle. It's a corner but a corner with exactly pi uh -huh. turns back on itself. Okay? Uh, so what's the rating with this kind of shape and the, the function mapping? Okay, so we're going to see that. Okay, so Okay, so here is the intersection of a tangent plane at a parabolic point. So that's a level curve at level zero, at height zero above the tangent plane. Notice that it has a cusp. Okay, that curve, that curve of level height is comes from, from the one, it's one of the uh, thing, specific singular events in the catalog for that mapping. Okay. Uh, I don't understand what the, the can is and what the victory is. Okay, here's the, here's the, here's the uh, thing we're talking about. Here's the parabolic curve. At the parabolic point, there's a tangent, there's a tangent plane. The tangent plane pierces on one side and doesn't pierce on the other side. Right? It's like this. And the, the local form of the piercing, which is to say the height above the tangent plane function at height equals zero. Okay, so the tangent plane is the thing that ha is zero distance from itself. <laughs> You're used to that in image analysis, doing that sine distance thing. So the height equals zero place above the tangent plane is the tangent plane. And that height equals zero place, that is to say the tangent plane, intersects the surface necessarily in a cusp at a at a parabolic point. Okay. Uh, another example is this. So uh, I will make available to you a tool called Shapemonger, where you can watch what happens to the to the uh, normals for any given function as you map them up to infinity where the ten, where the uh, essentially the Gaussian circle it's 
understood to be what you think of the whole surface as being scrunched down very small and you're mapping onto a big units thing which is very far away. In any case, what happens is at a, again, at a parabolic curve, some of them going this way and some of them going this way and they cross, right? <laughs> And so what happens is that as you go, the surface does what's shown here. Okay, <coughs> it folds past itself because the because the the um, normals cross at some point. If, uh, if I dilate a small object, so without some smoothing, so eventually like this, the work comes. Yes, if you have if you have a hyperbolic region. But if you have a if you have a convex region or a concave region, it doesn't happen. So there's this fold that you get. You see it on the right, up on the up on the uh, Gaussian sphere, and the fold has two cusps. You see you see the cusp at the top end and at the bottom end, right? Well, that is one of the uh, singular, the small number of singular things that are in, are in the catalog of 221, okay? <laughs> and if this one gets a name, it's called Libs. Sort of like this. Okay. <clears throat> There's another one that looks like this that gets the name Swallowtail. <clears throat> it also has two cusps here and here. And there's another one called Beaks that looks like that. Two two cusps facing each other. Are they touch each other? Nope, not at the moment. We're now gonna do transitions. Okay, and now we have singular transitions where the two cusps run into each other as these lips get really, really small. Mm -hmm. and, a and the transition is to nothing. Is to a, you can think of it starts off at a, at a point with the unbelievably tiny lips. Before that, there was nothing. And out of nowhere appears this infinitesimal lips, and then it grows. That's the transition from nothing to lips. And you can show that that's all that can happen generically. Here, the same sort of thing happens. That is to say, these cusps approach each other. And eventually you get a corner where you can think of there being the unbelievably tiniest swallowtail there. Okay. And then the very, and this is the non-generic situation, but the very next thing is this smooths out. And so you have two cusps, no cusps. And this guy, what happens is these two come together and these two come together. And you end up with the no cusps again, but that way. That's called beaks. And those are the transitions that we see. <clears throat> okay, so I'm done with my short discussion of singularity theory. The main point is that it gives us catalogs such that when I know NPC, I know all that can, all that can happen, right? Those are the only singular events. Those are the only uh, transitions between singular events, <coughs> or between singular and non-singular. The, the singular situation and the non-singular situation. And this allows us to analyze, for example, the swing of the normal up onto the Gauss up onto the Gauss map, up, up onto the unit sphere, the Gaussian sphere. This R2 to R2. And so let's talk about that now.
So we start off, get a handy dandy piece of Play Doh. We start off with a convex, an ovoid. That is to say, something that is convex everywhere. Might make this happen really fast, but you'll have to believe that this is approximately convex. And if I look at what happens to the Gauss map, it folds nowhere. Every normal goes to a single point on the Gaussian sphere for a convex object. Likewise for a, for a concave region. <clears throat> And I start pushing down to make a furrow. And as I do, what happens is exactly ellipsoid. That is to say, at some amount of depth, just when you have the tiniest infinitesimal hyperbolic region pushed in, you get a little, little tiny ellipse. And then as you push further and further and further, Ellipse grows. <laughs> okay. Why? Why like you have? Uh, if you push a little bit, then you get. Uh, it's still convex until I push enough. So push a little bit, nothing happens. To lift, uh, to lift this in a function space. Matching place, like, oh, it's, it's what's happening to the Gauss map, what's happening to the mapping of normals to the unit sphere. Okay, and what's happening is as long as it's convex, nothing's crossing. No. But as we push down more and more, the nearby normals start to swing towards each other and towards each other, and, and just at one point, it becomes the same. And that's that lips event happening. And then you push further and those normals pass each other. And you get this fold that you see on the screen here. Okay? <clears throat> so that's the formation of the furrow and that's all that can happen to form a, form a furrow. Okay, now, <laughs> what can happen once you have a furrow? Okay, so in other words, the only thing, only generic thing that can happen as you deform an object is a furrow can be created. If you want, another furrow can be created, another furrow can be created in various other places, but let's not worry about those. Okay, what can happen to this furrow? <laughs> well, one possibility is you pull up a hump in that furrow. That's this thing here. That turns out to be another let's move down here. Another lips event inside in the Gauss. Okay, so what's happening on the picture on the screen is as you're crossing the furrow here. We, as we're coming to the parabolic curve, we go all the way under here. And then at the, at the parabolic curve, the normal swings back on ourselves. <coughs> That's what makes it, the, because the curvature cha sign changes. And we come along the middle of the three surfaces in this fold. And then when we come to the other parabolic curve, whoop, the other parabolic curve, which is from here, which crossed to here, now we're coming to the other parabolic curve, we're actually the normal swinging back this way. And then we go here. So the middle here, the middle surface in the fold is the region that mapped between the parabolic curves, and that's the furrow. So the furrow maps onto the middle surface of this three Three-fold surface. You see what I'm saying? This this is a fold. This is a fold and a fold back. So here's a fold, and here's a fold back. All right. And so if you look, what happens here? We have a top surface, 
We have this other surface, and we have the third surface that are all, all of that. And one of these corresponds to the right side before you got to the parabolic, the convex region before you got to the parabolic curve. The lower is after you got to the parabolic curve. And the middle is the, between the two parabolic curves, it's the, the, furrow, the furrow region itself. And so what we're doing now is creating another fold in that middle region. And that's the hump. And that's this. You have a ellipse in ellipse. And that corresponds to a situation Okay, so this this is what appears on the on the Gaussian sphere, on the unit sphere, where normal stuff happens. Okay, you get double, you get a fold, then you get a fold within a fold. <laughs> this is the hump in a furrow. Hump in furrow. And on the, you can show that on the uh, actual surface itself, the surface on the left in the picture, the surface on the right is on the, Gauss, on the Gaussian sphere, the surface on the left is on the original surface. Clear? On that, what's happened is in one of the families of principal curves, there has been a, a zero crossing from negative to positive, and then another zero cross uh, from ne positive to negative, producing a parabolic curve, parabolic uh, curve that looks like that. <laughs> and then in the other family, nothing much happens. There's no, it's it's always negative curvature. Okay. And inside of this guy is the hump with its parabolic curve. Okay, so let's talk about here. We have an outside parabolic curve se separating the outside convexity from the furrow, and another one separating the hump from the, from the furrow. Those are those two. And so now we have two zero cross, and we have a bunch of zero crossings. So you come across here, it's positive to negative to positive to negative. Positive. Uh, to positive to the positive. Did I say that right? It's positive outside, it becomes negative inside. Sorry, it's negative outside, it comes positive inside the furrow, positive again inside the hub, negative inside the go ahead and set it right. Negative because it's convex. Positive in the in the furrow, negative in the hump, positive in the furrow, and negative outside. Okay? That's one generic shape type, the furrow or hump in the furrow, right? <laughs> the other thing that can happen, we talked about last time, is that these two cusps that you see on the Gauss map can come around and bite each other. And when they do that, you get, well, the event that is two uh, facing cusps, and that's the that's the beaks event. <laughs> Remember, we only had three possible events. Lips is nothing to two opposite facing cusps. Swallowtails is two opposite facing cusps to nothing, to not nothing, but to a smooth curve. And beaks is two to each other facing cusps, two facing cusps, cusps producing two smooth curves. And that's exactly what happens here. And so what you end up with after the after this guy, after this guy comes around and becomes a cusp here and a cusp here. Uh, 
inside one estimate. Okay, so you end up with that. And then all of a sudden, these guys dilate and make two smooth curves, and you get that. And there's no cusps at all. But two curves, two parabolic curves, which on the Gauss map, I have a picture of this. Whoop. Why am I not moving? Should be left and right. All right. Okay. And there's what's happening there. It folds under and back, just as before, but with no cusps. And that's this situation. Okay. And the pair. There are the two principal. <laughs> two parabolic curves separating the hump from here. Sorry, se se separating the convex region from this neck and separating the neck from this convex region. And the, the neck is hyperbolic. And it has no cusps in the Gauss map. It looks like that. But in the process of wrapping this thing around, the whole business the picture of the green and, and red curves becomes, <coughs> let's see, it's the green ones. The green ones <laughs> become, can become wrapped around so that the whole thing becomes on the, um, on the surface itself, you realize this is the Gaussian sphere. I'm sorry, I never wrote up here. This is on the surface itself. <laughs> and you get this arrangement. And you have two parabolic curves. Like so. And they're green, <laughs> meaning they again, just like before, they're in the same family. They're in the radial family, not in the circumferential family. Okay? And that's the pair. And that is the next generic form. Now you can nest these things. So inside the hyperbolic region of the pair, you can pull out a hump if you want, <laughs> right? <laughs> or you can take the hump inside of a furrow and rotate it around and produce another thing that's pairish in there. Or all sorts of things like that can happen, but these, they happen in a specified sequence and you can know that that's all that can happen from the singularity theory of discussion. Okay, so now let's come to the final. Okay, and so in order for this to happen, there has to be one point where the, all the radial things happen, and that's an umbilic. Okay, that is to say a locally spherical point, a point where both curvatures, both principal curvatures are the same. Okay, and that you can prove that that necessarily has to happen. Okay, so the last piece of the puzzle is the dimple. <clears throat> the dimple happens when you push harder in the furrow. Okay, so we have this furrow and we're now going to push down the middle and it's going to push down hard enough so that both principal curvatures become positive. Right, so one of them became positive when you formed the furrow, and then the other principal curvature become crosses zero, and now they're both positive. Right. 
what you can show is that what has to happen there is that <laughs> you have the lips corresponding to the furrow. And then the other family, and that's why these things are opposite to each other, unlike the hump where the two cusps are sort of facing in corresponding directions. This one here, and this one here, and this one here, and this one here. But these are sort of opposite, it's the other family of principal curves. And when that lip, lips event happens, we have what's called a, uh, a pre-dimple stage one. Okay, I'll call that. It's kind of dimple, but it's not a fully fledged dimple. Okay, so that second, <clears throat> that second uh, lips has been formed. Next thing that happens so it turns out that this ends up being uh, an n equals two, p equals two, c equals two singularity. Lips and beaks and uh, swallowtails are still there, but there's two more that get added, and I won't uh, won't go into great detail with them. But one of them, and they're called the elliptic umbilic and the hyperbolic umbilic events. Not important to really remember those names. But the the wild thing that happens is that at the transition. One of these, the cusp of one of them hits a non cusp of the other. And when that happens, they pass through. And surprisingly enough, the cusp gets traded. That turns out to be the singular event. That you can pass a cusp from one one fold curve to the other when they when they intersect. Okay, right. But after passing, so the red one will not have not have a cusp, and the green one has a cusp. So now the green one has three cusps, and those cusps, by the way, are these are the places of these ruffles. The, the the ends of the parabolic curve, if you will, the places where the principal curve just is tangent to the parabolic curve. So if we can have a furrow, then we have two cusps, which is the top one and bottom one. So mm -hmm. if you create a, a dimple inside the furrow, then where is the third, for example, you have crossing, where the third uh, uh, cusp happens? On the well, you have to think about what you have to. You need shape monger to understand that to watch watch it as a movie, and then you'll see the the two parabolic curves, <clears throat> the full the two folds, one with a cusp running into the other one and passing through, and you see it has to do with how the normals behave at those. So you have to watch it, what that movie from the surface to the sphere. As, as a movie and then look at it a moment later uh, when it's passed through and you see, you figure out what's, what's happening. Anyway, so that's stage two. Three dimple stage two. And at the full, this guy runs in, this cusp runs into there. 
and we end up with the full dimple. So now I've the full dimple. Where one guy has four cusps and the other one has none. So one of them has an ordinary fold like you like you saw, you know, without a cusp, like you saw up here on the screen. And Uh, see if I have this. I don't have it in there. Yeah, I do. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so this is the dimple picture. And you see that there's two, there are two uh, parabolic curves. One separating the concave region at the bottom on the right, the, bo the lower, uh, the dip here. <laughs> from the hyperbolic region that pushes up towards the t from there to the rim, and another one roughly at the rim. <clears throat> the one on the top, the one at the top, is really like what happens for a torus. If you think about a torus, it has two parabol. It has a re convex region around here and hyperbolic region inside from here in and there's a parabolic curve that goes right around the top here and that parabolic curve is also a principal curve so the principal curve is tangent to the parabolic curve everywhere there's a cusp everywhere on the cusp map it is unbelievably bad, badly behaved. Now, it doesn't happen as bad, necessarily as badly on this thing, because that's not necessarily going, the rim is not going to necessarily be flat on, all the way around it. It'll undulate. But the point is, you'll get multiple cusps, multiple ruffles, multiple places where all hell breaks loose. <laughs> where, okay, where things. I shouldn't say but multiple places where there's big time transitions all around. Okay, and so the dimple is a complicated object, unlike the pair. And the complication comes from this guy that ends up having multiple cusps. Okay, so and the picture, well, all these pictures belonged over here. Sorry. So this picture should have been like that. And like here. And then you said that the next thing that happened was it's a cusp. The red thing loses its cusp. And then the bad picture. And the picture over here for the full dimple, the picture on the surface is again. This radial behavior, and I don't mean precisely straight lines, but I mean. And then the other family is like this. But the difference is that you get one <coughs> parabolic curve that's green. <coughs> that's the inside one. Nothing much happens. <coughs> and you have another one that's red. Two families. One family gets one of the 
switch switches and the other one gets the other upside. <coughs> and the result is that this dashed curve is going to be tangent to at many places to one of these principal curves that's circumferential. <laughs> and you get these tangent places, which are the ruffles where there's a lot of change. And finally, you still have this umbilic. There's gotta be an umbilic at the bottom of a, the bottom of a concavity. <clears throat> okay? Okay, so I've, I've finished my catalog. That's all there is, except for nesting. For 2D surfaces in 3D. <clears throat> it's just nested versions of furrows, humps and furrows, pairs, and the three stages of dimple. Typically, you see the full dimple. Okay, so uh, let us finish up. I've done. Uh, Shape types have done umbilics, pattern of interval curves, the principal curvature. And well, da, da, da. <clears throat> okay, so I have uh, <clears throat> a couple of things left to talk about. The first is geodesics. That is to say, curves that are have zero geodesic curvature. Remember that omega one two tells us the swing of one into two, and if that swing and that swing can be positive or it can be negative or it can be zero as you walk along a particular path. And if you're walking along a particular path and it's not swinging, then that little place on the curve is geodesic. It's locally straight. The <laughs> as you walk along the curve, the the uh, the one vector and the two vector, the principal those two principal vec those two principal directions do not swing. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> the main okay, so a lot of a lot of image analysis, image analysis and statistics on images and so on try to use geodesics as the for the same kind of purpose that a straight line is used on a flat surface. <clears throat> so, for example, if you're trying to find principal components in a high-dimensional flat space, they're planes and a and a you can talk about distances from a point on the flat space to one of those hyperplanes. And a distance, you mean a shortest distance path, that is to say a geodesic path. <laughs> and now when you want to do the same kind of statistics on curved surfaces, whether you want a distance from a point to a, they say from a sphere, a high dimensional sphere to a subsphere, or in the case of a, a Two sphere, the one sphere is a circle on that, and you want to find a distance from a point on the subsphere to a circle to a you know you want to, the distance you have in mind is a geodesic path, right? The shortest distance to get there. <clears throat> and the main thing to be said about geodesics is the computational mechanisms that you need to get them are necessarily iterative. You, you do things like take a path and then successively straight, iteratively straighten it, find the curviest place on it and straighten it there. And then you get a new one and you straighten it again and you straighten and you straighten and straighten iteratively you get. Or you know that you're trying to find shortest distance paths. And so not because one of those geodesics is the shortest distance path. And so you can take a path of some, some path and successively shorten it. But they're all iterative methods. And the point is that finding geodesics in direct, in direct computation is complex, is computationally, it's non-direct. 
And this gets in our way when we're trying to do a lot of theorems. <laughs> and then we end up also worrying about transport along those paths. And we get into this parallel transport stuff that we talked about, so they achieve it to transport, where when you do that transport, you lose information. You saw what happened with this angle lost business. You. <clears throat> okay, so enough about geodesics. The final little section here is the effect of geometry on appearance. And the two kinds of appearance Now, this is visual appearance. And the reason I've left this to last is because in medical image analysis, where the only time we're interested in visual appearance is when we have light cameras, you know, for endoscopy, for example. But if you have, you know, a MRI or a, or a CT in 3D, that it's not how they appear, it's what their properties are. Okay, but, but okay, so appearance, I'll say to the eye. And there are really two issues. One is called contours and the other is called shading. <laughs> shading is how intense the surface appears when you reflect light from it. And contours is a general generalization of the word silhouettes. And a silhouette comes when a ray from the visual, <clears throat> from the fovea of the eye to the surface just grazes the surface. It's, ten it's in the tangent plane. Okay? So we have this visual ray P. <clears throat> And T is orthogonal to the normal where it touches. Put another way, it's in the tangent plane. <clears throat> so we can have a touching of a ray that transverse. It isn't normal. <clears throat> and so if the surface is like this and the normal's like that, it's just runs it runs into the surface. The, this is the this thing is T. That next level of order of contact is what happens for a contour point. And the reason it's not uh, this is the objects here. It's a generalization is that we may have another piece of the object occluding it. <laughs> and so it's no longer part of the silhouette because it's occluded, but it's still said to be part of the contour because the tangent ray is still tangent this way to the surface. The contour is all places where this stays locally out of the surface, except at this one point where it's tangent. Okay. <clears throat> And so we study the, the, the behavior of these contours, just as we study the shading. And anyway, the surprising, the surprising result has to do with studying singular points of the shading and of the contours. So shading is a function uh, <clears throat> from R2 to R <coughs> to R1, that is to say, a mapping from location on the surface to intensity. <coughs> and we're interested in maxima and minima. And well, it turns out there's three singular kinds of points for mapping two to one. 
you know them. <laughs> They're the max, the min, and the set. Okay. <clears throat> and so we're interested in these critical points, max, min, and saddle. Moreover, you can show that the singular transitions involve creation or annihilation of a min saddle or a max saddle pair, and that's all that can happen. You can't create, I won't go into the arguments for why that's so. It has to do with a, something called the, the winding number or the index of the fun, of the function. But in any case, um, <clears throat> we find that those events, those annihilations, can only happen at parabolic curves. Okay, so the point is that these special events are tied to very special places on the geometry. Okay. <clears throat> Now let me just say a few words about contours and we'll be done. The first thing is when I have a an eye, it's looking like this, and we see this. That place is a point on a continuous contour. <clears throat> and as I march along the contour, there is a common misapprehension, simply not so, that somehow the surface is perpendicular to my view ray. And no, not at all. As I walk from your eye to here, here here's the, the silhouette's, the curve that's on the contour is not at all perpendicular to that. And it has to do with what happens to the tangent, <clears throat> sorry, So when you're walking in the tangent direction, what happens to the normal? And the normal has to fall away from me in order for this to be a silhouette point. But the normal falls away for a particular walking direction in the, remember, the conjugate direction, the hinge direction. <laughs> and so you need to find the hinge direction from here, or put another way, the, the tangent to the silhouette, or the, the pre-image of the tangent to the, of the, the pre-image of the contour, that is to say the curve here that where the silhouette is formed from uh, has an angle to the viewing ray, which is the, the, the conjugate angle. And this sort of should bring into mind that, wait a second, there are these self-conjugate places <laughs> where what we call asymptotic directions. And what's going on there? And what's going on is, and a, okay, so we have, let's say we have a furrow. This is a cross section of a furrow. We're looking down this way, right? I'm going to turn this thing, or you, equivalently, you move your viewpoint. I'm going to turn this thing, and what's going to happen is this thing is going to get sharper and sharper until it becomes infinitely sharp. Not a cusp, a corner. That is to say, not a 180 degree turn, because what's happening is a swallow tail effect. Well, one of these hills actually comes in front of the other. So let's say this is the one that's in front, and this bit here is behind. <laughs> well, this place that formed the nascent 
dwells ill of it. In other words, the one where it looked like it was, is, um, at a place on the, in, it can only happen in a hyperbolic region at a place called a fleck node. Fleck node is spelled F O E. The fleck nodal curves are the curves where, okay, so we saw this before. If I can find the picture that I have back here. There, this locus of the inflections of these asymptotic curves. These asymptotic curves have one, they're convex for a bit, and then they're concave for a bit as curves, and they have a zero an inflection point. And the locus of those inflections are the fleck nodes. And when your visual ray is touching a fleck node, <laughs> that's what happens. <laughs> okay? Not time to go into it in this particular summary, but if you're interested in silhouettes and contours, you got to know about flag nodes. <clears throat> okay, and so the picture that you end up with uh, by the way, there's a beautiful picture of the swallowtail, the swallowtail having happened in a faro as you swing it around. You see the swallowtail in the right picture? <clears throat> okay, so what you see is this picture that I had before of a parabolic curve surrounding the furrow, which is the curve on the outside. And the figure eight thing is the is is the fleck nodal curve. It's actually a fleck. There's two of them: one forming an S, and the other forming a backwards S. And they come together, the whole business comes together tangently at the two ruffles, at the two places <laughs> where all sorts of interesting things happen. Okay. Um, so at the flight node, you have higher order contact than this kind of contact that we saw here. That is to say, it's splatter, it's fourth order contact when you're looking through. Okay, and that leaves the, what happens here at the cusps of the contour. And what happens there is that <laughs> the Going ray is tangent, but it but it also pierces. <clears throat> These cusps are where the, the part of the surface you can see and the part you don't see touch to each other. So this cusp here, and for that matter, the one that you can't see over there, <clears throat> looks like it looks like a contour end. Contour comes down and just stops. And so you so what you see is this. Right? But that thing really is a cusp where this guy is come comes over here and then comes up right there. It's like that. <laughs> and these cusps can only occur in <laughs> hyperbolic regions when you're looking down, when you're self-conjugate. The self-conjugate has to do with the fact that this direction and that direction are the same direction, <laughs> right? The hinge is, you, it's you're self-hinged. And so that can only happen when you're looking down an asymptotic direction. <laughs> okay, so, so those are the two major uh, behaviors on uh, on appearance. So, 
we're done with the, the whole presentation. I'm going to do now a three minute uh, sort of big summary, and then we'll be done. We spent most of our time talking about 2D surfaces and 3D. But lots of what we said has application to higher dimensional surfaces, you know, to n minus one sur dimensional surfaces in ND. And so in both cases, you have normals, and you can talk about the swing of the normal, and you can talk about principal directions, which are directions of <clears throat> pure nosedive, with the walking direction and, and the uh, <clears throat> swinging direction are the same of the normal. And where you get local max and local opto, local optima of, or maxima or minima of curvature. <laughs> or in higher dimensions, I guess probably saddles as well. <laughs> uh, anyway. Um, and so this whole business about principal curves, principal curvature, Gaussian curvature, and so on, is really important. And it, and it extends to higher dimensions. <clears throat> the next thing that we looked at were these special regions convex, hyperbolic, concave, but in higher dimensions, you <coughs> convex corresponds, if say, say you have a, a three-dimensional surface in 4D. Now you can have a place, so now you have three principal curvatures rather than two, <coughs> right? <coughs> and you can have all three of them negative, two of them negative and one positive, one of them negative and two positive, or all positive. And so you get four kinds of surface types. <clears throat> Whereas in three, three, uh, two dimensional surfaces, in three dimensions, you had three kinds, concave, hyperbolic, and convex. Here you have concave, hyperbolic type one, hyperbolic type two, and, and and convex. <clears throat> but the same general idea applies that you have regions and you have curves <clears throat> on the surfaces that separate one region from the other. They were, they were parabolic curves. <clears throat> and you have the principal curves and you have interaction of the principal curves with the parabolic curves. And you have these special places, the ruffles, where the two, <clears throat> where the par where the parabolic curve of a particular co color, that is to say, a particular family, and the um, principal curve of that same family are tangent. And very interesting things happen at the parabolic curve, but even more interesting things happen at the. Um, at these tangent places, at these ruffles. I'll take a brief aside from a summary to say that there's one other kind of interesting point visually that we haven't talked about <clears throat> that, that has to do with transitions that happen at these contours. And these are places that are called gutter points. Uh, so just as ruffles are cusps in the map from normal to the sphere, you can have a map from asymptotic directions to the sphere and it can cusp. Okay, and those cusps end up being gutter points. Okay, and those gutter points have something to do with the visual behavior at the contour, and I'm not going to, uh, not going to uh, tell you exactly what happens. It has to do with that on one side of the gutter point, visual events that occur 
are described by the lips event done on the other side and you cross on the other side uh, <clears throat> past the gutter point is a place along the parabolic curve and it divides it into regions where you get lips events regions where you get beaks events okay <laughs> It all comes down to, I mean, it all, all. So that's the next thing to say in the summary. That singularity theory is uh, very informative about geometry and helps us un see that these catalogs are the full catalogs. And for high dimensional surfaces, they can be applied for in, this, in exactly the same sort of way. You tell me the N, the P, and the C, and I'll tell you the catalog. <laughs> it's a different, I mean, yet this is something that's online. You know, the singularity theorist has written this catalog. They have a, an N, a P, and a C, and they say, here's the catalog. <clears throat> but for really high dimension, like the one for 100? No, I'm sure they haven't written, the, the catalog is not published for really high, high dimensions. On the other hand, Jim Damon is a singularity theorist. And if you need that, you go to him and you say, tell me, let's work out what this is. <clears throat> um, a lot of this same theory applies to skeletal models. We haven't talked about skeletal models, the behavior of skeletons, the singular points, the singular places on skeletons and so on, is all again completely described by these catalogs. And you'll find all that in the works of Peter Giblin, G-I-B-L-I-N. Peter is a singularity theorist. In fact, he spent a sabbatical here with Jim Damon. And um, he has done a lot of things having to do with singularity theory of ridges and singularity theory of skeletal models, <coughs> medial models. Uh, and um, so there's a lot to be read there too. We haven't talked. We didn't talk about ridges in this in this overview, but that's another area of special of spe special uh, interest. And these ridges have to do with loci where when you cross when you go on a principal curve you reach a relative max or a relative min of the, the corresponding principal curvature as a function as you walk along the principal curve. <clears throat> so there's plenty more to learn. I mean, obviously, in whatever I did, we did six lectures or seven, I don't remember, seven. Uh, that's not the same as a semester with 30 lectures. Uh, and in fact, our lectures are almost all an hour, and those are normally 75 minutes. So the upshot is there's a lot more to say, but the, the sort of the idea was this is the, the the basic stuff that you should have seen, you should be aware of when you do um, segmentation, registration based on surfaces, or what have you. <clears throat>